was a little bit amused by a tweet from last week's um, Ideas Economy Conference in New York. And it went like this. Profound insights draw on common sense, but we normally have to read it in a management journal before we trust our instincts. Well, I'm not a management consultant, nor a scientist or a researcher. I'm a practitioner, and I work in the trenches of creative discovery where ideas bubble up, and I help guide them through a long, linear path to adoption. So I'm not unafraid of risk-taking, and today I'm going to put a dangerous idea out there. I believe that our online addiction is slowly snuffing out our ability to innovate. How about that? I call it the learning paradox of ubiquitous connectivity. <laughs> and it goes like this. More time spent online does not necessarily increase learning. In fact, the concurrent sensory deprivation may in fact inhibit our ability to innovate in the physical world. Let me illustrate with a little story. I call it mother's epiphany. So I was, I can't see the age of most of the people here, but I'm sure many of you didn't grow up with the internet like I did. In fact, I didn't even grow up with television. Um, we only got it when I was 13 in South Africa. Uh, I came from an average family. Dad was an accountant. Mom didn't have a career in those days. And our grandma lived with us. She was a self-taught seamstress. Now, Dad was a bit of a hobby gardener, but it was the women in my family that really rocked in the creative stakes. And um, sort of family gatherings were a sensory feast. Uh, everything from fantastic food through to floral arrangements and decorations and scale and drama. So they really turned uh, throwing a party into a life skill. By the time I was 10, I was baking cookies for local fundraisers. And... Um, by the time I was 11, I had created my first business innovation product. I was making posies out of those jawbreaker lollies and selling them for a buck. But my mother closed down my factory when to, in order to keep up with the demand, I had to quit school, and 11 wasn't a good idea. By the time I was 12, I was making um, designer garments to order for the neighborhood's Barbies. Uh, the point of this is that I never had a single cooking lesson or a sewing lesson in my life. I learned these skills by hanging around the ankles of the adults in my house and through observation. And um, I wasn't afraid to take risks and try things out with my own two hands, and I sort of worked it out from there. I never contemplated this thing called creativity um, and how it connects our early experiences, particularly our tactile experiences, in the development of our innovation capability, where we really need to draw on that to solve complex problems and conceive ideas. We kind of need to know how the, how the world hangs together. Not until 1987, when I had a job um, in BHP Billiton, where I was um, responsible for imp uh, developing employee capability around solving complex production problems in an aluminium smelter. Now, I knew nothing about that. I trained as an accountant. And so this is how I came to have my first epiphany. Um, I had to basically work out how to construct an innovation process by deconstructing it for myself, because this was the days before Google and the Internet. And that's when I realized that people's ability to solve problems and think things through was directly correlated to the range of diverse experiences that they had in their memory to draw upon. Turns out that those instincts were right. This year, in the book The Innovator's Dilemma, um, co-written by Clayton Christensen, an eight-year study of how the world's most successful innovators work basically validated this instinct. Um, it looked at the behaviors and habits, particularly early childhood ones in the tactile world, of people like Michael Dell and Steve Jobs and Jeff Bozes, 
Um, and it also looked at corporate executives who were quite successful at maintaining um, innovation growth in their firms. And it isolated a common trait around experimentation. They were all makers and tinkerers and model builders and deconstructors. In my own career, on reflection, I realized that my own innovation breakthroughs came when I was, in fact, drawing on skills that I didn't know that I had actually acquired. I think the educators call that unconscious competence. Now, let's roll the clock forward by one generation. My own children, I think that slide was up, yeah, that's the right one now. Uh, my own children grew up in a single parent household where I was working long hours to make ends meet, um, not unlike half of Australia's families. But in spite of this circumstance, I was determined to draw on my professional insight and make sure that my children had access to a range of experiences so that they can remain creative. And so there was a lot of emphasis on physical outdoor play, making things together, and travel. But without realizing it, I also created a problem. In my eagerness to be a good mum, I stocked the house with every digital content creation device and sharing device known to man. We had a Wii and PlayStation and MacBooks with sophisticated software, digital piano, um, video cameras, a lighting kit, Kindle, iPhone, iPad, you name it, we've had it all. So by the time my youngest daughter was 10 years old, uh, she had made and shot 10 of her own movies and uploaded it to her own YouTube channel. I didn't even know this. My 16-year-old daughter, they were good movies, by the way. <laughs> My eldest daughter was recording music on GarageBand and uploading it via um, MySpace. And I felt vindicated. I was a super cool mum with digitally literate children and the creative evidence to prove it. But that was before BB, BF, and WOW. Blackberry, Facebook, and the world of Warcraft. Before the lure of online networking sucked us into its powerful web. With a Blackberry permanently glued to my hand, because after all it was work, I was the first to succumb to the dopamine rush. Twitter is my drug of choice. <laughs> and no matter where I find myself in the universe traveling, I could always count on a rapid fire of collective intelligence and nuggets of inspiration, no matter where I was. When my kids reached high school, uh, they discovered Facebook because MySpace has kind of lost its cachet. And pretty soon, we were one crazy, hooked-up family, permanently plugged into the global brain. I still didn't connect how bland our lives was becoming. Not until a recent family holiday where we were forced to disconnect did I realize that in the time that we've spent connected, we've actually wandered off into creative stagnation and the wilderness. In two years, we hadn't made a single thing in the physical world, not a cake. We didn't organize any parties at the house. We were too busy. We didn't even make a photo album. Remember those? And um, I just realized there was nothing physical being produced. Now, is this just an example of a bad role model? Parenting without boundaries? Are we extremes? Or is this happening to other families as well? Yes, it is. Exhibit A our growing online dependence. Scientific research has now confirmed the dopamine effect and brain chemistry changes triggered by online social networking. Gaming, internet surfing, texting, and the world has seen its first rehab center for online addiction. I don't know if it's related to Australia's geography at the bottom of the universe, but 78% of us are plugged into the internet and we are the world champions of social networking. 
We spend, on average, 7.1 hours per month on social networking, but seeing that this is a bit of a connected crowd, I would guess that it's probably more in your case. My daughter said last night, Mom, it's more like 20 hours per week um, at our age. Online gaming follows closely. I couldn't get Australian statistics for this, but can you believe that Americans spend 866 million hours a year on a mobile phone game called Angry Birds? <laughs> the scary thing is that it's growing minute by minute. But we know the constraint is that there's still only 24 hours in a day. Where's this all coming from? Doctors tell us it was stolen from sleep. Physicians tell us it was stolen from exercise. Shoppers, retailers tell us it was stolen from spending time in their shopping centers. Um, and the middle class is saying, you know, we're stealing it from their jobs. Even the porn industry is complaining that it's losing eyeballs. Here is another scary fact. Exhibit B, cognition is complex. Aristotle was the first to name the five sensory organs through which we perceive. Descartes has said that sensing is integral to thinking. And Nobel physicist Richard Feynman said, if he needed to understand something, he had to actually learn by doing, he had to build it. Sense perception is one of three pillars of reason. The other two is concept formation and logic. But here's the thing, the common trait here is that they actually all work together to receive and then process information through extrospection. Extrospection meaning learn from outside yourself. According to Dr. Howard Gardner's uh, theory of human cognition, we have multiple intelligences. So things like spatial intelligence, um, body kinesthetic intelligence, naturalistic intelligence, musical intelligence, even existential intelligence. But they all work together they don't work into, uh, independently. So when we're actually learning or trying to innovate, we draw on all these things at the same time. Just think about it. You could have watched this online for free, but you chose to come here in the physical world. Why? Because online experiences at best, at best, involve two of our sensory organs, sight and sound. Okay, tactility gets a bit of a look in through, you know, our fingertips. But that's a bit like a peck on the cheek compared to a full hot-blooded love-making session with Old Spice Man. <laughs> Taste and smell doesn't even get a look in. There's a double jeopardy here. Sensory deprivation combined with ubiquitous connectivity being always on impairs our cognitive processing ability and with that, our ability to draw on memory to innovate. Ubiquitously connected devices deprive the brain of the precious downtime that it needs to digest everything we're feeding it. This is not a revelatory study. You know, it's hardly surprising. Scientists from UCLA found that when rats explore new territory and new terrain, they do form new patterns in the brain, new areas light up. But it's only when the rats take a break, have a rest, that the memory gets laid down so that the memory can be embedded. Otherwise, they don't retain it. So here's the thing. If you are hyper-connecting, hyper-consuming, and hyper-sharing, Unless you're bookmarking all those fabulous links on Facebook and Twitter, they ain't staying in there. Now, I'm not a social media naysayer or the internet fun police. In fact, as you've heard, I'm an evangelist for technology. And I am constantly, every day, fighting to integrate this into the way we, we innovate at work. Never before in the history of humanity have we had so much freedom of speech and access to information. Free tools, software and affordable technology. Free access to markets and group buying. Participation 
in cheap capital, microfinance, easy payment systems, a voice, our own, our own media, a deep pool of labor, talent, and ideas anywhere in the world to draw on, the ability to share overheads and infrastructure costs, and mountains and mountains of data. But there is no such thing as a free lunch. The price we pay comes in time and attention, even if it's free in monetary terms. If we are sacrificing too much in terms of reflection, introspection, and extrospection, is this price we are paying too high? Would it come as a surprise to you that the biggest innovation challenges that the world faces are problems of physics and biology? We really need to innovate beyond Moore's law and Metcalfe's law of networks. We have bigger fish to fry. Two weeks ago, at Silicon Valley's coming out party for startup wannabes, um, Peter Thiel, the rock star venture capitalist who co-founded PayPal, declared that innovation in the world today is somewhere between dire straits and debt. In 40 years, we have had stagnation, except for computers and the internet. Thomas Friedman, in his recent book, That Used to Be Us, and I do recommend it, it's a great read, said that he pointed to a series of events where America's innovation, uh, where the innovation machine called America basically walked away on two occasions from the opportunity to own the next big thing beyond the internet, which is how to feed our insatiable appetite for energy. Wouldn't it be nice if just half of the brains that spends the time on angry birds could apply their thinking, could apply their thinking to come up with energy solutions so that our planet doesn't have to be fracked up by coal seam gas miners? So, what can we do that's different? And what can companies do? It's not that the internet is bad, it's not that we're weak. Dopamine is a powerful drug. So here's the good thing, you can download software to manage it on the internet. And set yourself some time. Uh, limit your time so that you take a break and reflect. Keep a journal, just like a food diary. Keep a journal of where you're spending your technology time. Are you spending it on empty calories, or are you balancing it with nutrient-rich physical experiences? All the more if you can do it with a child. A game of real tennis is far more developmental than we tennis. Make it with your hands, not with a mouse. A simple idea is to cook something from scratch, and perhaps you can actually go and grow your own garden or pick your own vegetables and herbs. Invite a friend over, turn it into an event. Introduce a digital Sabbath. We did that recently at AMP, and um, we managed to raise $40,000 for social innovation projects. For companies, sponsor more innovation prizes for projects and the problems of the physical world. And let's have more make fests and do fests to complement think fests and talk fests like this. So here's my TED wish. Let's better connect with our maker instinct. Let's understand the interplay between technology and education and how that affects our cognitive process to design, to design solutions that make the world a better place. In memory of Steve Jobs, if you want to put a ding in the universe, you have to practice your swing. The innovation, the revolution may be tweeted. Innovation has to be made.